Hi everyone, good afternoon. My, my name is Austin Arena. Uh, my wife, Jackie Arena, is also here. We're both attorneys here in the San Antonio area. And, and just like Dr. Sullivan said, today we're giving a brief overview of, of what we think is most important and what we recommend. Uh, really, where do you want your stuff to go and, and how that process works uh, when that end of life comes. Uh, just as a little precaution, we always have to do this is, uh, you know, the, the, the lawyer, the legalese is uh, we, while we really intend for this to be very beneficial, we've worked very hard on it. Uh, at the same time, each situation is very individual. And we recommend that after this, you're going to have the, you're going to have the ammo, you're going to have the, the questions to go ask uh, an, an attorney, uh, what's right for you. Uh, briefly about me, uh, again, my name is Austin Reyna. Uh, I work at the Fourth Court of Appeals here in, in San Antonio, went to Texas State, uh, graduated from St. Mary's Law. Uh, I'm, I'm licensed in Texas and, and barely a few places. Uh, really what brought me and my wife to attention here is my mom. She was diagnosed uh, two days before Christmas in, in 2019. Uh, and sadly, she passed away in February 2021. Uh, right after the snowstorm, it was bull bar ALS and it was, it was quick. But from that process, we really understood uh, what's, what's needed and, and how, how can we help. Uh, I'll say uh, when my mom was first diagnosed, she, she didn't have a, a medical uh, power of attorney. And so my dad and I had to go through and figure out, because at that point she, she couldn't use her, her hands. And so we had to figure out what is needed. And uh, Jackie and I's hope is that that doesn't happen. To, to someone else and, and Jackie um, not only is it her birthday today but she's she's an amazing lawyer um, an amazing person she, she works at Laura her law office where they particularly do wills and estates um, probate and family law uh, and actually two days uh, before my mom was diagnosed with ALS her grandmother passed away uh, from from ALS so it's a it's a cause that's really near and dear to us, and, and we hope this, this talk is helpful. So briefly, this is gonna be a grand, grand overview of what do you need, uh, what you need to ask. A lot of times, and, and Jackie can speak uh, to experience of this, a lot of people will come in and say, uh, I, I need this, or I have this document. Um, I got this off of you know, legal Zoom or something like that, uh, is it valid or, or, or does it work? And a lot of times you don't need that many type of things. You need really what's important. And Jack is going to get more into, into that later on. But I'm, I'm going to start with what's called a do not resuscitate. Yeah, a lot of times you'll hear people briefly call them DNRs. And, and do you need one? Uh, technically, no. But for someone with ALS, it's I, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's something that it's not gonna, uh, it, it's really what it comes down to is if you're in a situation, you know, if you don't have a peg tube uh, and you um, are, are in need of emergency care, do you want to go, does your loved one want to go naturally, quote unquote, or do they want someone to provide everything they can? And that, that decision, you know, I highly recommend that you talk with your loved one early on and make so it's not something that, that uh, is, is done in the moment rationally. And so if this is signed, then what will happen is when EMS comes, they'll give comfort. Um, you know, they'll, they'll provide medication to where they're not in pain, but they will not provide life-saving measures. Uh, importantly here, again, you can't just get it off of the internet, sign it, and you're good to go. Not only does it have to be signed, which we'll, we'll talk about later, there's some, there's some things you can do if your loved one can't you know, use their hands or they can't you know, physically sign, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that later, but it has to be signed and there has to be a qualified witness or a notary. Um, the easiest will probably be a notary, uh, but if you have two people there with you, then, then that will work as well. Uh, and I'm gonna pass it off to, to the birthday girl to handle some directives. Thank you, Austin. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a few of the directives that um, we normally recommend, and by we, I mean my firm here, that we normally um, would say is the best way to go. Um, so we're going to start with the power of attorneys. There's two types that we normally provide here, 
and that we recommend. Um, there's also the, oh, sorry. <laughs> there's also the directives to physician and to family, um, which honestly, the, the medical power of attorney is actually a bit broader and covers more. And we don't do the directives as often here but if we have clients who do a medical power of attorney. Um, but I'll talk about those as well. Okay, so the, and an overview of this is just with power of attorneys, um, there's a statutory durable power of attorney, which can control your finances, um, any type of perhaps personal care or um, items that you need, right? Um, there's also the medical power of attorney, which would be for your medical care. Um, and then what each of the documents can and can't do. So I'll go a bit more into that. Okay, so <laughs> the question is, what is a power of attorney? I have a lot of clients who come and see me who have no idea what that is. They came in for a will or they came in because they think a trust is what they need and you know they didn't even know what a power of attorney was. So a power of attorney is a legal document that gives another person the legal power to act on your behalf while you're still alive. It is only in effect while you're alive. Um, at your loved one's death, it is not in effect anymore. It's done. Um, and so it cannot be used after your loved one passes away. Now, the person that's appointed in the power of attorney is called the agent. And the person who signs a power of attorney that makes someone else their agent is called the principal. And now the person that you appoint as your agent does not have to be an attorney. Um, usually what I've seen is it is a loved one, a child or a spouse. Um, and if that person does not have a child or a spouse, it's normally a sibling or somebody that they, you know, trust with their life. Um, a hiccup that I will say that I have seen recently is I had somebody come in who had a power of attorney um, and they went to their bank and their bank said, unfortunately, we can't accept this because they looked into the agent, his history, and he had some financial issues. Um, he had filed for bankruptcy and possibly had some credit issues. I'm, I'm not sure, but for the statutory terrible power of attorney, AKA the financial, the, the financial power of attorney, um, certain places can reject it if they have a policy internally that says, oh, we looked into this person's history and they have some background issues that we don't want to mess with, right? So they have the authority to reject even a perfectly drafted power of attorney if they have an internal policy that says, we can't accept this. Um, and so that's just an issue I ran into recently that I wanted to make y'all aware of, um, that if you do have a person as your agent, you need to make sure that um, they will be acceptable in that way. Um, so what do you need for a power of attorney? Um, again, the person you trust with your life and sound mind, and, we'll, and we will go into that a bit more. So what does sound mind mean? So sound mind means when the person is in the office and I hand them the paperwork and I explain everything to them, that they're able to understand the effect of that power of attorney, that what it's going to do, um, and that that person will be able to act on their behalf and, uh, and the extent of actions that that person will then be able to take on their behalf once a document is signed. So they need to understand what is happening at that time. Um, so for example, probably a person in the later stages of Alzheimer's cannot sign a power of attorney if I ask them questions, you know, and they, they don't know what they're signing 
or they maybe don't know what day of the week it is, um, who, who the president is, the year. I ask those sometimes if there's maybe a question of that type of um, issue. Okay, so the basics. So the biggest one is gonna be the statutory terrible power of attorney. And again, this would be for your finances and personal maintenance. I can't stress enough that this is a very powerful document. Um, there's two ways that you can, I guess, have it be in effect. So you can have it in effect immediately once you sign it, which is what our firm normally would r recommend. The second way is upon your loved one's disability and incapacity, um, it's in effect. Now, the second way, the hiccup there is that you need to have a doctor's um, note or authorization that basically declares this person is incapacitated, they can't sign this, and if there's anything that needs to be done right away, you know, that, that could take time. Um, so what I would recommend is that you have it be effective immediately and not wait until you're declared disabled or incapacitated. Um, but it's, they're both legally fine. Legally, you can do both. And then I've heard stories where a person has it in effect immediately and they call and say, my daughter took all my money. Because <laughs> again, it's very powerful. But if that's the situation that goes more towards who they pick as the agent um, and maybe not the document itself. Um, so you wanna make sure the person that you pick again is somebody that you trust with your life. Um, and then the medical power of attorney, this would, this would authorize an agent to receive and make any medical choices on your loved one's behalf. And it typically does become effective immediately once it's executed. Um, the only, you know, you do need two witnesses and a notary but you cannot, um, the witnesses cannot be in charge of your health care um, or have any type of stake in your estate. So um, that's definitely one that you would probably want to have executed at a lawyer's office. Um, and that's something I'll go into a bit more later. Um, then there's the special power of attorney and this special or limited power of attorney, which I don't do too often, I don't really have too many who want this particular type or it's not needed, I guess, in their situation. Um, but the powers with this are limited to only a specific situation or area. Like if, some, if the principal wants to sell a house, but they're not able to be there. Or for example, my husband and I, you know, I'm expecting, I'm six months pregnant. And once we have our child, if we leave to go on a trip or something, we're out of the country, I would probably do a special power of attorney so that my mom can be the agent and make any choices for our child while we're away. Um, so in short, it starts and stops at different times. Okay, so uh, the next logical question would be, what can a statutory durable power of attorney actually help me with? Like, what's the point of me signing one? Um, you know, there's all these rules and, you know, my agent can't have any bad credit and some places don't even accept them. Like, why, why would I get one? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. You know, you need this to access the principal, your loved one's financial accounts if you're not already on there. 
um, to pay for health care, housing needs, and other responsibilities that they're not able to take care of at, at that time. Um, file taxes on behalf of the principal, make investment choices on behalf of the principal if they have a trust or something set up, collect any type of debts, manage their property, and also apply for any type of public benefits for that principal on their behalf, like Medicaid or, or, or any other type of benefit. Now the medical power of attorney, um, that can control what care the principal receives, including hospital care, surgery, psychiatric treatment, home health, um, which doctors and care providers the principal uses, where the principal lives, including long-term health care, like assisted living, medical care, nursing homes for medical purposes. So there's those two types of situations and, and, and that's why they're so important and, and useful, especially, and, and for the medical, especially if there's not really like a next of kin or somebody there who can, who uh, the hospital or, or the agency is okay with to say, yes, that's fine. You know, if that person doesn't have those people in their life, then they probably need a medical power of attorney. I, I've heard some stories of some hospitals saying, oh, you're next of kin, it's, it's fine, but you don't know, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that you need and not every place will, will say that. A lot of places want you to have a medical power of attorney. And those are just more examples um, of powers in a statutory terrible um, that we normally have listed, like real property transactions, which if you want your agent to do that, um, you need to um, have that filed with the deed of records at the courthouse um, where your property is located. Um, tangible personal property transactions, I'll let y'all read that, but pretty general, you know, um, but that's typically what the statutory can do. What can't a power of attorney do? Um, can't change a principal's will. I think some people, some, I've seen some where that's an option, you know, to change a trust or change or make a gift. Um, we don't recommend that. Um, we really don't because that could just be very complicated, especially if there's maybe some other siblings involved or children that would not agree with that, um, and that could just cause problems later. Um, they can't break their fiduciary duty to act in the principal's best interest. Basically, everything they do, it has to be for the benefit of the principal, you know, like they're doing this because the principal you know, can't act at that moment, at that time or that moment, they can't do those things. Um, so if they, you know, pay themselves, or they steal money, you know, then that's not what the power of attorney is for. Um, make choices on behalf of the principal after their death. Again, don't think if you just have a power of attorney, you don't need a will. The power of attorney ends on the death of the principal. It's only active while your loved one or the principal is alive. Um, change or transfer the POA to someone else. Usually in our, in our power of attorneys, we have an alternate in case the first choice for agent does not want to or is not able to qualify. Um, so they can't just say, well, I want my wife to, and the wife's not named in the power of attorney. I have an example there, just, yeah. <laughs> you can just read it because I think we're running out of time. Um, so the durable power of attorney is a writing that designates an agent signed it must be signed by the principal in the presence of a notary and again we already discussed this you can pick from one of these two options it either starts immediately which is one the power of attorney is not affected by subsequent disability or incapacity of the principal or two this power of attorney becomes effective once the principal is disabled or incapacitated. And again, we 
don't normally recommend that for clients because it, again, if you have to wait for a doctor to say they're incapacitated, it's effective, you may, you know, it may cause some unnecessary delays. Medical power of attorney, same kind of concept, um, signed in the presence of, except it does need to be signed in the presence of two competent is interested. Again, they can't have any help in your medical care. Um, they can't work for the hospital um, and they can't have a stake in your estate or anything once the person passes away. And um, the witnesses will sign. And we normally have two witnesses and a notary for, for ours just to make, you know, be extra safe. Um, these are the directives. We always have a lot of people that ask about these, um, but the medical power of attorney should cover it um, because the directive will basically only state that um, I, you know, in the event that I'm in a terminal condition um, and I'm unable to make those choices for myself, um, I request that all treatments besides those keep me comfortable, be discontinued or withheld and I pass away as gently as possible or I request I be kept alive in this terminal condition with life-sustaining treatment. So that's what the directive does. It just says yes, keep me alive however possible or no, please let me pass away. Um, we, I also, when we do the medical power of attorneys, we recommend um, that you sign a HIPAA form as well and it has a list of people who you're okay with receiving your medical information. Um, so, and for that, you need a competent adult, sorry, but you go back one, <laughs> um, sign in the presence of two witnesses or, or, a notar or a notary, and you can notify uh, your doctor of this form. So I'm, I'm gonna take over the wills here and I'll be, I'll be pretty brief and I know we're running out of time, but uh, one thing I do wanna highlight is that I didn't forget about, I, I wanna come back to is the conscience presence test. Uh, and, and in Texas, I mean, and, and as we know with this disease, uh, sometimes <clears throat> the first thing to go are, are, are your hands and, and you can't write, you can't do uh, what you used to be able to do, hold, hold a cup. And so what's great about Texas is we follow the conscience presence test. So what that means is, as long as someone has a sound mind and it is by their direction that someone signs for them and they can see that happening, then that is valid in the state of Texas. So for instance, uh, an, a, another great thing too is anything that that person adopts as their signature uh, is valid in Texas. So just because uh, I, I have one signature now uh, and, you know, if, if later on I, I couldn't do that signature because of an ailment or, or something like that, but I, I had a sound mind, I was in the presence of, of Jackie, uh, and I told her I, I wanted, you know, a line with a dot to be my signature, and, and I adopted that as my signature, then that's a valid signature, uh, and that, that will apply to, to wills and indirectives. Uh, so for, for traditional wills, uh, they are... A lot of people get them off these, these online places and they don't have the technical requirements. Um, and, and these are very hyper specific to your situation. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, time on, on these wills, but I recommend that if you do want a formal will that you go to a licensed attorney in your area and go with the big, the big stuff, you know, what do I have? Where is it? Who do I wanna give it to? If you have those three questions answered and you go to a licensed attorney who practices in wills and estates, they should be able to draft a will for you and walk you through the steps of, okay, this is how we need to have it, to have it technically um, executed and you're gonna, your stuff's gonna go where you want it to go. What I really wanna focus on is holographic wills. Now, while traditional wills need to be signed and they need to, or they, they need to be fully in writing and go through all these technical requirements. A holographic will does not. All it has to be is 
wholly signed in the person's handwriting and it has test has to have testimony intent, meaning I, Austin Reyna, give everything to my dog, Rocky Reyna. Well, it, it can't be a dog, it's a bad example, but I, I just I just want to see Jackie's face. I, Austin Reyna, give everything to my wife, Jackie Reyna, uh, upon my death. I sign it, it's completely in my handwriting, and that can be probated as well in Texas. One of my favorite stories. Uh, in, in past law school, in, in law school of the case we read, where a farmer was on his farm. I don't know how this happened, but he got ran over by his tractor. So he's on, under his tractor. He knows he's going to die. So what he does is he takes out his pocket knife and he writes into the bumper, this is my last will and testament, says who he wants to give his stuff to, signs it, and he dies. So what happens is they take that bumper into the courtroom and they probate it as a will because that's a valid will. It was completely in his handwriting, signed by him and had the testimony intent. So if you're at a point where you, know, you might not have time to get in and, and you're so busy, but your loved one can still write, I highly recommend uh, the holographic will as, as an option. Uh, and with that, that is that is our, our presentation. And